Welcome to the Revenge Story Times channel, Janet had been a wonderful wife ever since we got married a few years ago. Our relationship was strong, and we shared a fulfilling life together. Up until now, she had never given me any reason to feel jealous or suspicious of her faithfulness. That's why I was surprised when she asked me to meet with the vice president of her company. Three years ago, she started working at Global Connections and quickly rose to the position of marketing manager in an international entertainment firm. As you can imagine, she meets all kinds of people and attends numerous events, conferences, consulting sessions, and marketing meetings. Some of their clients are well known, like the New York Knicks, the Chicago Bears, and the New England Patriots. Her energetic and cheerful personality, combined with her intelligence and professionalism, made her the perfect fit for the company. She often told me about her plans, successes, and daily work activities, and I was always happy to listen and proud of her accomplishments. She dreams of becoming the vice president of marketing and works hard to achieve that goal. Global Connections is a British organization with offices around the world, and its manager, Ian Bai, is the vice president of marketing. In his early 50s, he achieved success on his own. He has been married three times and has nine children, three of whom are from his current wife. When Janet told me about her boss, I couldn't help but think it's good that he earns a high salary to support his relationships and divorces. One evening, Janet started talking about Ian, telling me about her day but only in a professional context, nothing personal. She explained that he would be coming to the US for two months, which would give her a chance to show him how valuable she is to the company and make it clear that she is interested in advancing her career within the organization. That's my girl, driven and focused on her future. We had recently started talking about having children, and I asked her if a promotion would affect the timeline for growing our family. She said she wanted to secure her position in the company while Ian was here, and then let me know whether we should start a family or postpone our plans for a year. Either option worked for me, as we were still in our 20s and not in a rush to have kids, but we did want two, a boy and a girl. We spent many evenings and hours choosing names and imagining which universities they would attend when they grew up. We were in love with each other and eagerly looked forward to raising our future children. A week after Ian arrived, I decided to drop by Janet's office to surprise her and invite her to lunch. When I walked into her office, I saw Ian and my wife standing way too close, and she was giggling and flirting. The moment I greeted them, she quickly stopped and moved away from him. Janet introduced me to Ian, and I swear it was then that I saw a smug grin on his face. Ian, this is my husband, Brian. Brian, this is Ian, the executive vice president from our corporate office, remember I told you he was here for a short time? Then I saw it again, he gave a self-satisfied smirk as he spoke, well, hello there. So you're the little husband. Nice to meet you, but you'll have to excuse me, I'm running late for a meeting, and he quickly left the office, avoiding any further conversation though I found his greeting incredibly rude, especially for someone in his position. Janet, what the hell was that? and why were you clinging to him and giggling? I wasn't in the mood for laughter, and I had an overwhelming urge to wipe that smug grin off his face, but he was gone before I could do anything. She could tell I was upset by how our introduction went and tried to calm me down. Calm down, darling, it's just Ian. It was nothing more than some harmless flirting. Besides, he's old enough to be my father. Look, all the girls are crazy about him, he thinks of himself as a ladies' man with that charming British accent of his. He loves to flirt, but we all know he's just an overconfident fool. Still, he's the boss. Anyway, he's a family man, and you have nothing to worry about. It's just playful flirting with the girls, he calls it entertainment. Well, I don't like it, and the nerve of him to call me the little husband. Why are you flirting back with him? Oh, Brian, stop being jealous. Ian is the third highest ranking person in the entire company, and I have to be polite to him. Like I said, he considers himself a ladies' man, that's just how British men are. Well, I don't like it. Calm down, he's leaving in two months. After that, there was tension at home for a few days, and Janet tried not to mention his name or upset me any more than I already was. Then, on Wednesday evening, about a week after the meeting with Ian at the office, Janet started a casual conversation over dinner. Darling, do you mind if I have dinner with Ian, you know, my boss from work? 
I tensed up a bit as it took me a moment to fully grasp the question, and I responded with a question of my own. You mean something like a business meeting? Well, no, it's more like a one-time dinner before he heads back to London. I immediately felt a knot in my stomach, and my heart started beating faster. I sat in silence for a long moment before responding, I see. This is the same Ian who flirted with you and made fun of me in your office, the so-called family man, married with nine kids from three different wives. Well, yes, but he's turned out to be quite a pleasant person. He won't be staying here much longer, and I'll probably never see him again once he returns to London, so I thought one dinner would be fine. Like I said, he's married and has children, there wouldn't be anything romantic, just a bit of fun. One night is all I'm asking for, it might even help my career. I mean, you're always traveling for work, and one night out shouldn't be such a big deal. Alright, so it's not just dinner, it's a date, and you want to spend the entire night with him. Let me make this crystal clear, Janet, I will not, under any circumstances, let you go on a date with another man while we're married. Do you understand? The very fact that you even want to be with another man is making me rethink our entire marriage. Seeing my reaction, she panicked. Oh God, no, you've got it all wrong. I love you, and you're my husband. Ian is just a one-time thing, and I'll be back the next day. Nothing between us will change, and he'll disappear from our lives forever. My God, it's just one night. I looked at her with fury in my eyes and simply said, get out of my life. I'm filing for divorce in the next few days. Then I stood up, walked to my closet, packed a bag of clothes, and left. She kept begging me to come back as I drove away from what was once our happy home. In less than 30 minutes, my once happy marriage had turned into a complete disaster. The calls from my loving wife started almost immediately, followed by a flood of text messages in which she professed her love and insisted that no one else would ever take her place in my life. In the next message, she tried to convince me that I was still her loving husband, that it was all a misunderstanding, and that I needed to come home. As I drove, I kept telling myself that if she could be swayed so easily, our future as husband and wife was in jeopardy, and it would take serious effort to repair the damage if that was even possible. I stayed away for two nights, ignored her calls, and took time off from work, asking them to tell her I had gone out of town on a business trip, Jen. Ever since Ian showed up at my office, all the women at work were captivated by this strong, handsome man who drew everyone's attention. He was tall, well-built, and spoke with a mesmerizing accent that was both charming and hypnotic. From the moment we met, it became clear to everyone that he had taken an interest in me, his compliments, private meetings, shared lunches, and all the extra time he spent with me made other women envious, each of them would have jumped at the chance to be with Ian, married or not. The married women were even more vocal, encouraging me to take things further. Janet, he's asked you out a few times already. Any one of us would switch places with you in a heartbeat. He's so handsome, and that accent makes us all swoon when he talks. Accept his offer and have fun with this powerful man. You may never get another chance like this. Brian doesn't need to know, and he will be back in London soon, so there wouldn't be any issues later on. The girls from the office kept pressuring me every day, and eventually, I gave in. Deep down, I knew I could never act behind my husband's back, so I came up with the idea of asking Brian to let me go on this one date, just once, and then everything would go back to normal. The girls assured me that Brian would understand and grant me this one night, at least that's what most of them said. When I told him about it that evening, I was shocked by his anger. IT wasn't supposed to happen this way, and now he's gone. I can't believe he just left like that. In desperation, I called Gail, one of the girls from work. Gail and I had started working in the same department on the same day three years ago, and we had been inseparable since. Crying into the phone, I said, Gail, it's Janet. He's gone, he left me. Janet, what are you talking about? I told Brian that I wanted to have dinner with Ian, and he just walked out on me. He stood up, packed his things, and stormed out of the house. He even mentioned divorce, and now I'm afraid I've lost him. Nonsense, he's just angry. You hurt his fragile male ego, but he'll come back. You haven't done anything yet, and he knows that. He may sulk and be mad for a few days, but he'll forgive you. 
We'll figure out another plan to get you and Ian together, trust me. I don't want this. I only need my husband, Janet, relax, have a glass of wine, take it easy. I'll see you at work tomorrow. The planning of her affair continues. Brian returned home two days later and moved into the second bedroom. Gail was right, Brian was furious, more than anyone could have expected. Although Brian loved Janet, he was ready to divorce her if she mentioned Ian's name again. At the very least, marriage counseling seemed inevitable. For the next week, Janet did everything she could to earn Brian's forgiveness. After a week of seeing his attractive wife but with no intimacy between them, Brian decided to suppress his anger. They had a passionate night together, and Brian even forgave Janet, but he gave her a firm warning, next time, I won't come back. Janet narrowly avoided disaster and promised Brian she would never make such a mistake again. She shared the whole story with the girls at work, admitting that she almost lost her husband because of her foolish idea. However, the girls were undeterred and came up with a foolproof plan to bring Ian and Janet together. It became a group project, and the marketing team was determined to accomplish their goal of arranging a meeting between Ian and Janet before he returned to London. One of the women, Marcia, came up with an idea that the team loved, taking their plan to the next level. Ladies, in two weeks, we're having a year-end celebration dinner at the Hyatt Hotel. I know for sure that they're planning a nice dinner for the whole team with live music and dancing this year. They want spouses to attend, and when I heard about it, I had a brainstorm. You know my husband, Clark, is a sales representative for a pharmaceutical company that specializes in anesthesiology. His company developed a new formula of Malum. For those of you who don't know what that is, I'll explain. Malum is a drug given to patients to calm them down before surgery. It knocks them out in seconds and causes short-term memory loss. From that moment on, they don't remember anything until they wake up currently, Malum is administered intravenously, but the new product, S2Mid, comes in pill or liquid form. Well, Clark's hot new product is S2Mid, and he's selling it in large quantities. It works like magic even better than the original formula. And how is this supposed to help us? Gail asked, as Janet listened with a puzzled look on her face. Gail, I'm glad you asked. Since these are Schedule 2 drugs, Clark keeps his sample locked up in his car. He makes sure they're secure and out of reach. However, sometimes he takes my little Mustang Cobra for a drive. When he's out, I can easily grab his keys, take a few pills or some liquid, and no one will ever know. Okay, Marcia, that's interesting, but what's your plan? Ladies, you're going to love this. At the party, when everyone's gathered, I'll pour myself a drink and pass it to Brian. From past encounters, I know he can't resist a glass of Crown Royal, so I'll casually hold two glasses in my hand and offer one to Brian when I see he's ready for a drink. The effect can take anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes, depending on how much he drinks, but he'll start feeling sleepy, dizzy, and eventually pass out on one of the chairs. We'll guide him to then. We'll tell everyone that Brian isn't feeling well, take him to your hotel room, and put him to bed. He'll be out for at least four hours and most likely won't wake up until morning. Turning to Janet, Mara continued, when we get him to his room, that will be your signal to go with Ian. Go to his room and spend a few hours with him. We'll cover for you here and tell everyone you went upstairs to be with Brian. After a few hours, you can return to your room, take a shower, freshen up, and then cuddle up with Brian as if nothing happened. Girls, I can't do this to Brian. You're asking me to drug my husband just to have a fling with Ian. Do you realize how crazy this sounds? Brian will kill me if he ever finds out we're even considering this. Sure, I know it would be exciting and might boost my chances for a promotion, but if Brian caught me, he'd divorce me. Yes, it sounds just about as crazy as you missing the chance with Ian. Come on, it's safe, and Brian will never find out. Ian will owe you, and your promotion will be guaranteed. The last thing Brian will remember is you asking him if he's okay and telling him you love him. And when he wakes up in your arms, you'll have wonderful memories of your night with Ian and you better share all the details with us, sister. I don't know, this is crazy. Listen, give me some time to think. Things at home are better now, 
and Brian is no longer angry. I'll tell him about the party and see how he reacts. Janet makes her decision later. While in bed, Janet said, Brian, in two weeks, we're having our annual dinner, and spouses are invited. You'll need to clean and press your tuxedo because it's a formal event. We haven't been out dancing in a while, and I think it will be fun. Janet, as much as I hate these events, I'll do it because I know it's important to you. That evening, I showed my appreciation by being affectionate. We shared an intimate moment, and afterward, Brian was clearly happy and satisfied. That night, he fell asleep as a contented husband, however, my own desires began to surface, and suddenly the idea of a one-time fling with Ian, something I had never considered before, started to take hold of my thoughts. At that moment, I decided to move forward with the plan and texted Mara, I'm in. Can you get the medication? A minute later, a reply came, leave it to me, no problem. Janet enjoyed her intimacy with Brian, but the thought of being with Ian excited her. The thrill of doing something that would only happen once and never again kept her on edge and constantly aroused. She wasn't sure if it was the allure of doing something forbidden or the idea of spending the night with her boss, but either way, she stuck to the plan. She promised herself it would only happen once and Brian would never know. Nothing too serious, nothing truly wrong, right? Over the next week, Brian noticed that Janet was on her phone more often, texting her friends frequently. He knew the party was approaching but he had a nagging feeling that something was off. A few nights later, while Janet was sound asleep, Brian took her phone, entered the password, their anniversary date, and opened her text messages. For the next hour, he read in horror about the plan for that night, including the drug, the timing for when to slip it into his drink, how long to wait, and how they planned to get the key to his room and put him to bed. He found out everything, who was supplying the drug, who would be spiking his drink, and, worst of all, how Ian was involved in planning to take Janet to his room while Brian was unconscious. Then, after Janet finished with Ian, she would leave his room and return to her hotel room, pretending everything was fine, while Brian was still unconscious, unaware that the drug was still in his system. That was all he needed to know, after uploading all the text messages to the cloud, he returned her phone and tried to sleep again. It wasn't easy. He was horrified to learn that the woman he loved had planned to drug him and betray him on the same night. This was war, and he was going to prepare. They would all pay for their betrayal, Brian continued to play the role of the loving husband, monitoring her messages and staying up to date with their plans until the day of the party. During that time, he called his uncle Bob, his godfather, and a retired police officer. Brian explained what was happening, and together they crafted their own plan. With the right timing and a bit of acting, they could outsmart the entire group of conspirators. Their secret team included Ellie Johnson, Uncle Bob's former partner in the police force. Ellie joined two of Brian's army buddies, Craig Marks and Jimmy Jones, to help with their plan. Ellie's role was to make sure Brian didn't consume any drug drinks at the party. Uncle Bob, Craig, and Jimmy would handle the tough work that was to come later that night, Brian recalls that work event. As I expected, Janet was wearing a very revealing dress with a deep neckline, black stockings with seams, and high heels. Her makeup and hair were flawless, and it pained me to realize that she wasn't dressing up like this for me. The fact that she was doing this for another man was a betrayal I would never forgive. You look very sexy tonight, darling. Is this all for me? Of course, dear. I want you to show off your beautiful wife and be proud of her. I almost choked hearing how easily she lied to me. This woman was planning to drug me and sleep with another man right under my nose. She didn't care that I would be humiliated in front of all her colleagues, who were fully aware of what she was up to. No, all she cared about was being with this guy, and I still couldn't understand why she was risking everything for a one-time fling. As my dear old dad once told me, women sometimes can't grasp rational thinking. We arrived at the party and Janet's friends quickly surrounded her, pulling her into a circle where Ian stood. I followed them, scanning the room for Ellie, Bob's former police partner, who was nearby. We had planned for Ellie to help with the drinks to ensure I wouldn't be drugged. I spotted her off to the side as I approached the group surrounding Ian. Unfortunately, I couldn't stand next to Janet because she was now beside Ian, who had his arm around her waist, laughing and telling jokes. 
My instinct was to pull her away from him, but that would have ruined our plans, so I just stood there, watching her actions, and it caused me immense pain. My stomach twisted and bile rose in my throat as my anger intensified. She was so captivated by Ian, giving him all her attention. In that moment, I didn't exist in her world. I stood near some other guy, watching Ian perform for a crowd of onlookers. That's when Ian noticed me and decided to have some fun at my expense. Well, look who's here, the accountant. Welcome, little man, he said with a malicious grin. At that moment, Janet saw my face and suddenly realized that it was Ian, not her husband, holding her close as he continued, you know, Brian, I've got a few jokes you'll appreciate. What do accountants use for birth control? Their personalities. Everyone looked at me and laughed, including Janet, which I admit, hurt my pride. He continued to humiliate me in front of the entire staff, and my wife did nothing to stop him. It was incredibly painful, but I had to keep my cool and let our plan unfold. The jerk was having a great time now. Did you like that one, Brian? You're a typical boring accountant, you know. Then he rattled off another dozen accountant jokes, and each time, everyone, including my wife, just looked at me and laughed. Your wife has amazing W-2 sneakers. My wife found that amusing. Oh, baby, let me withhold you. The women around just giggled. Technically, sex with an accountant is a charitable contribution. Janet laughed even louder as my humiliation became unbearable. In Brian's office, Iris means I'm really sexy. My anger was building. If I help you fool Uncle Sam, can I be next? That was enough. I had reached my limit. That was all the humiliation I could take. I turned and started to walk away, and he kept tossing jokes my way, laughing. Ian called out as I left, come on, Brian, come back, little man. I was just joking. Rage consumed me as I walked away. Sure, Ian was a few centimeters taller than me, but keep in mind, I'm not a small guy. At 185 centimeters tall and weighing 90 kilograms, I could break that Englishman in half in two if I wanted to. Of course, Janet knew that, but at that moment, I wasn't so sure. The only thing I was certain of was that these idiots had to pay the price for the disrespect they were showing me. What on earth was Janet thinking? Was she under his spell? Did she really think I would just accept this disrespect? As I walked away, I suddenly felt someone's hand wrap around my waist, and to my surprise, it was Janet. Honey, he was joking. Come with me. I gave her an angry look and said, Are you out of your mind? You stood there while he had his arm around your waist, laughing at me with everyone else, while he openly humiliated your husband. And now you want me to go back to him? What kind of loving wife does that? I've never been so humiliated in my life. For God's sake, I make more money as an accountant than any of those jerks, and you just went along with him like I was a clown. Just go, Janet, go back to that loudmouth. You two deserve each other. Brian, I'm so sorry. Please don't be mad. Let's sit and talk at our table for a few minutes. We eventually made it to our table and I noticed Ellie a few meters away, observing the situation. Janet continued to focus solely on me, trying to calm me down, and after my second drink, I felt a bit more relaxed. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw Ian approaching our table with a foolish grin on his face, reaching out to shake my hand. No hard feelings, buddy. Get lost, jerk, I said, surprising everyone at the table. Shocked by my outburst, Janet said, Brian, he's my boss. Please don't talk to him like that. That's when this arrogant guy had the nerve to ask my wife to dance. Janet, it's fine. I hurt the little guy's feelings. Want to dance? She shot me an angry look after I told her boss to get lost, then took his hand and led him to the dance floor. After three dances, my glass was empty. And that's when Gail and Marcia came over to the table and sat next to me. I noticed Marcia was holding two drinks, and I knew it was time for their plan to unfold. Ellie saw everything and began to take action while the girls tried to distract me. Brian, Ian just has that British sense of humor. Don't take it so personally. 
Janet loves you, and she's just trying to impress her boss. Here, I brought your favorite drink, Crown Royal on the rocks. I was doing my best, and I saw the girls panic when I said, I don't know, I've already had too much to drink. Maybe I should just leave Janet here and go home. Both of them shouted for me to stay as I stood up to leave. I turned away from the table just in time, with the glass in my hand, and when Ellie passed by, I discreetly switched drinks with her. Then I sat back down and began sipping the watered-down Crown Royal that Ellie had prepared. She kept the original glass as evidence in case it was needed later. Maybe you're both right. I'll just be the boring accountant, let her flirt with her boss, and sit here, showing everyone that I'm just a clueless fool, I said, draining the entire glass. The look on Marsha's face was priceless, she hadn't expected me to drink the whole thing, let alone down it in one go. After I finished, the girls said they needed to return to their husbands. The show was about to begin, and I was left sitting at the table alone while Ian and Janet kept dancing. That evening, my acting skills were on point as I slumped in my chair, pretending to doze off. I continued to watch as my wife and her boss grew closer, shocked by how openly she flirted. After a while, I rested my head on the table and pretended to fall asleep. I soon heard the girls and Janet come over, trying to wake me. Janet leaned close to my ear and said, Honey, are you okay? Brian, wake up, sweetheart. I opened my eyes and saw my beautiful wife, who was betraying me while still telling me she loved me. I closed my eyes, knowing exactly what was coming next. That's when Gail and Marcia lifted me up and escorted me out of the ballroom to my hotel room, meanwhile Ian and Janet slipped out through the side door while everyone was distracted by the scene I was playing. As we reached my hotel room, I heard my phone chime, signaling a text message, and I knew our plan was in motion. The girls laid me down on the bed and began to undress me. I smiled to myself, hearing their audible gasp when they saw me. Gail, in particular, was surprised and said, wow. Janet never mentioned that he was this well endowed. I don't think Ian compares to Brian. If he leaves Janet, I wouldn't mind a chance to see what that's like. I can't believe Janet would cheat on him, but I guess we're all involved in this somehow. Shut up, Gail, let's get out of here. Once the door closed, I got up, laughed at their comments, got dressed, and checked my phone. The text message read, room 1722, at 1045. I had 15 minutes to get to the room and meet up with Bob, Jimmy, and Craig. I went to the bathroom, washed up, grabbed my brass knuckles, and headed for the door. At 10.45, the four of us were standing outside room 1722, just 30 minutes after the cheating couple had entered the room. Uncle Bob's job was to get us into the room and then leave, we didn't want him involved in what was about to happen next. Bob knocked loudly on the door. Knock, knock, knock. Ian's voice came from behind the door. Who is it? This is Sergeant Connor from the NYPD. Please open the door, we have an emergency. Uncle Bob held up his old badge to the peephole, and we heard the door open about six inches. Bob turned and left, having no idea what was about to happen next, just as we wanted. My army buddies Jimmy and Craig burst into the room, grabbed the naked Ian by the arms, and pinned him against the wall. I walked in with my phone recording the scene, my naked wife, Janet, on the bed, and my sworn enemy Ian, up against the wall. The look of shock on Janet's face when she realized I was awake and standing before her was pure terror. I was the last person she expected to see before morning. My face must have been twisted with rage, judging by her expression, when I spoke, you cheated on me for this? I said, pointing to her lover's unimpressive physique. You destroyed our marriage for this loser? You drugged me and lied to me. You really messed up, Janet, both of you chose the wrong guy to betray. Then I turned to Ian. I smiled as I saw the fear in his eyes, clearly focused on the brass knuckles I was wearing as my friends held him in place. What's wrong, Ian? No snarky comments? Where are one of your stupid grins? There was no response from the big guy, just a plea for forgiveness. As soon as the first sorry slipped from his lips, I beat him until he was unconscious. I didn't intend to cause any lasting damage, but my final punch shattered his large nose. 
Blood splattered everywhere as he collapsed to the floor, half-conscious, crying like a frightened child. Turning to Janet, I said, I'll probably end up in jail for this, but right now, I don't care. I'm sure you'll testify in defense of your lover because he's all you've got now. Yes, Janet, I knew about your plan to drug me, lie to me, betray me, and then sleep with this guy. Seeing the evidence of her infidelity, I added, you even went through with it while I was drugged in our hotel room downstairs, without caring about the potential side effect of the medication. And on top of that, you plan to come back to me, pretending to be my loving wife, telling me how much you care, how I passed out at the party, and how you and the girls took care of me all night. Well, my plan was much simpler. As tears began to stream down her face, I continued, first, you won't be coming home until noon tomorrow. You won't call or text me tomorrow morning. You'll be served with divorce papers right here at the hotel. The courier is instructed to wait until you sign them, and he'll have your signature notarized. I'm not playing fair with this divorce, you'll get the house, which has about $80,000 in equity, but I'll keep all of our savings and retirement funds. I've already emptied our accounts and cancelled your credit cards, so don't bother checking the balance. The terms of the divorce state that you agree not to receive any support from me, and we'll go our separate ways. And God willing, I'll never see your unfaithful face again. Your car is paid off, so you can keep it, but all the bills, insurance, gas, electricity, and the mortgage, are now your responsibility. Good luck with that. As for this guy, I'll be sending these videos of you two to his wife, and I'm sure that'll make marriage number four for your lover. You've got some catching up to do, but I'm sure you'll sleep with enough guys to reach that soon enough. Oh, and one last thing, if you sign the divorce papers tomorrow morning, we can part ways quietly, and no one will have to know about your shameful actions. If you don't sign, I'll send the videos to your mom and dad and explain why I'm leaving you. I'll also make sure both of you lose your jobs and destroy your reputations in this industry. We both know how important your career is to you. I don't want to do this, so just sign the papers by 9am tomorrow, or the life you know will be over. My things will be gone from the house, and whatever's left, you can throw out or donate to charity. Janet, now sobbing openly, tried to speak. Baby, please, talk to me. Don't do this. You know I just wanted to be with him once. I don't love him and don't want him. It was just supposed to be for fun and to help with my promotion. He was going back to London next week and I'd never see him again. Why couldn't you understand? I didn't want to endure any more humiliation and simply ignored her ridiculous words. I told Craig and Jimmy to head home. Guys, you can leave, you were never here. I'll take full responsibility if anything happens. After they left, I looked at my wife and quietly said, Janet, I loved you, but what you did is unforgivable. You knew how I felt when you first brought this up, but you decided to go behind my back and do it anyway. You involved others in your scheme, conspired against me, humiliated me, and even drugged me. You essentially kidnapped me to be with that loser. Well, you almost got away with it. Please, Brian, you can't divorce me. You know I love you and don't want anyone else. Baby, give me a chance to prove it to you. This meant nothing to me, it was supposed to happen just once. He's nothing compared to you, and now I realize how foolish I was. Please, sweetheart, don't do this. Janet, this would be funny if it weren't so absurd. You're lying naked in Ian's bed, and his mess is still on you, yet you're telling me you love me, and we can't get divorced. You know, this video will be something interesting to watch later. You're nothing but a corporate fling now. I'll never touch you again because you're spoiled goods. In fact, after tonight, I don't plan to ever see you again. After an awkward silence, Brian continued. Janet, the time for talking is over. When you conspired with your co-workers to drug me and cheat on me, you destroyed our marriage and everything we worked for. Do you remember the children we were planning for all these years? Emily and Jason? Well, because of you, they'll never be born. Our life together is now nothing but a sad memory. So, Janet, tell me, was that fling with this guy worth it? I hope so because you threw away our future for this small-time loser. Great job! 
You can have him now because this is the last time we'll ever be together. Brian walked out of the room as she collapsed onto the bed. Everything she had planned had gone up in flames, her cunning scheme failed, and her selfish one-time act led to painful consequences, leaving her without the man she truly loved. And she did love Brian. Sobbing into her pillow, she couldn't comprehend why she had let this happen. She began screaming, not addressing anyone in particular, delirious and devastated. When Ian, lying on the floor, regained consciousness, Janet shouted, but, Brian, the girl said you would forgive me because you love me, and it would only be once. It was just sex for God's sake, just sex with Ian. Can't you understand and forgive me? I'll make it up to you, and I'll never do this again. Please, don't leave me. Please, I love you. But Brian was already gone. The damage was done, and now she had to think about a future without the man she claimed to love. Gail, Marcia, Ian, and Janet were all arrested and charged with various serious crimes, including conspiracy, kidnapping, drug possession, and assault with the use of drugs. Gail was sentenced to two years in prison for conspiracy. Marcia received 10 years for conspiracy, possession, and assault. While Ian was given two years for conspiracy, the kidnapping charges were dropped. Janet was also sentenced to two years for conspiracy. Naturally, Janet, Marcia, and Gail lost their jobs, and their criminal records destroyed their careers. After being released from prison, the women were forced to take jobs that they had once considered beneath them, and their sense of dignity was shattered. Marcia's husband, Clark, lost his job due to the scandal and was unable to find a similar position, his career was derailed by his wife's desire to carry out her fantasies with Janet's help. He divorced Marcia while she was serving her sentence. Gail's husband also divorced her, and she lost the love of her two children, who never visited her during this fiasco. Ian pressed charges against Brian for assault and a serious nose fracture, however, after the jury heard the full case, Brian was found not guilty. Ian's wife divorced him, and he lost his job due to the criminal charges and allegations of sexual harassment in the workplace. Janet tried to sue Ian for sexual harassment in civil court, but by the time she was released from prison, Ian was divorced and penniless. After his release from prison, Ian received no severance pay or references from his company. The last anyone heard of Ian, he was broke, without job prospects, and on probation for the next five years. The luxurious lifestyle and freedom he once enjoyed were taken from him overnight, all because of his arrogance and inflated ego. Now, this once prominent man had been humbled and reduced in stature, Brian moved on, and true to his word, never saw Janet again. Five years later, he remarried, this time to Gloria, a woman even more beautiful than Janet. Gloria was intelligent and loyal, promising never to betray Brian. However, once burned, twice shy, Brian insisted on a prenuptial agreement before they married, despite her promises of fidelity. After everything he had been through, it was hard for Brian to trust any woman. Now, at 31, Brian was happily married, and the couple was expecting their second child at Janet, on the other hand, never recovered from losing Brian, the man she loved and never wanted to lose. Her depression lingered, and one night, as she lay in bed alone, something that had become the norm for her, she scrolled through Brian's social media page, just as she did every night since the divorce. Janet sobbed as she saw the latest picture of Brian's son, Jason, and his newborn daughter, Emily. She realized that Brian had built the family she had thrown away, all because of one selfish betrayal. Janet never remarried and could never forgive herself for her foolish, selfish act. They regret not what they did, but that you found out, thank you for listening until the end. See you in the next episode of Revenge Story Times. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Goodbye.